Buddy, thank you so much for uh, showing up this morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Dr. Shadia Rafidge, and we're going to talk about rhythmic airway syndrome. Feel free to ask questions anytime, either during the talk or afterwards. I'm open to anything, and this topic especially can be fairly subjective. So I'd love to hear anyone else's thoughts on this uh, condition and what you guys do to manage these dogs. A little bit about me. I graduated from Cornell University in 2006. I then did an internship at Angel Animal Medical Center in, uh, in Boston. From there, I did two surgical internships, then a surgical residency, became boarded in surgery, and then did a bit of traveling from New York to uh, Vegas, to Silicon Valley, LA, and then back to uh, Las Vegas, where I, I currently reside, and I operate vet triage. We're going to go over these aspects of the condition. We'll start off with trying to define the disease, its pathophysiology, how gastrointestinal disease relates to its clinical signs, diagnostics, and then from there we'll talk about uh, both medical management and surgical management of the condition, as well as outcomes and, and uh, prognosis. So um, obviously this is a fairly common condition. We see it in, of course, brachycephalic brain dogs. Uh, cats as well, but we're sticking to the dogs for, for this talk. And uh, the condition is defined by these, these symptoms, however, there are more than these diseases associated with brachycephalic airway syndrome. It's that we're going to focus on the more common ones, but as we dive into more advanced diagnostics with affected dogs, we're going to find more, more abnormalities with them. Because by definition, these dogs are fairly abnormal. So the elongated soft palate, hypoplastic trachea, nasopharyngeal stenosis, stenotic nares, diverted saccules, inverted console, consoles, and the pharyngeal collapse are seen in the brachycephalics to varying degrees. The thought behind the pathophysiology um, correlates to, to how the disease progresses over time. So as you have one condition develop, let's say with stenotic nares, for example, which clearly they're born with, over time, months, years, the other aspects of this disease then, then become evident. So the thought process here behind this condition to some degree is that you have primary conditions and then secondary conditions, obviously as a result of the primary ones. So when you look at the literature and what we see clinically, you start off with the stenotic nares and that, that begins the initial problem. And we do know from not a lot of studies on this, but when you operate on these dogs early on with just stenotic nares, it tends to at least inhibit or resolve the secondary changes like the palate and the, uh, the uh, um, laryngeal collapse. And so the goal here is to get these dogs when they're fairly young, but the thought is it starts off with stenotic nares that creates uh, airway resistance, increased pressure, which then results in a longer thickened palate. And that of course adds to the upper airway obstruction for these dogs. And then things head over downstream, larynx, then trachea and um, uh, lower airway. So that's, that's what we believe occurs with this condition. And you sort of see this timeline. If you, if you are working up a young brachycephalic, you're not going to find all the abnormalities that you'll find in an older brachycephalic. So it all, it all sort of connects that way. So synodic nares becomes the initial problem. Typically, we believe from there, the elongated soft palate, it becomes long, thickened, uh, creates an obstructive scenario here for the upper airway, and then you end up with the remainder of the uh, conditions here, pharyngeal collapse, the averted saccules, um, you end up losing the rheumatoid glottis here with, uh, with pretty advanced pharyngeal collapse, and here's another example, just swollen arytenoid cartilages and causing the uh, airway obstruction that we're familiar with. So um, if you dive into these dogs further, even between brachycephalics and not created equal, there are fairly mild brachycephalics, and there are some that are, that are pretty severe. This, this is a picture alone. Look at this, look at this pug's face compared, compared to the boxer. I mean, there's, there's, nothing, there's nothing there. It's so severe, and that's within the class of brachycephalic brain dogs. So as you, as you work up these dogs, you find out they have multiple abnormalities. So caudal aberrant um, turbinates are an issue for these dogs. This is a normal uh, uh, scope here, and here's an abnormal one where you have these excess turbinates that are that are invading the nasopharyngeal region, which just adds to the condition. And you know, when I when I was being trained, we never talked about these, and now we have advanced imaging is is more it's more uh, accessible. We're finding out they have other abnormalities as well. So 
where, where these things fall on the whole nature of this, of this disease. Hypoplastic trachea, another, another uh, condition as well that's thought to be maybe secondary, maybe not, it's tough to say. But for those who aren't familiar with hypoplastic trachea, basically it's a excessively rigid tracheal rings and a weakened trachealis muscle. So you end up with basically a narrow, narrow tube. So the trachea is not, not normal in these dogs either. Um, English bulldogs are notorious for, for this compared to the other brachycephalic breeds. When you look at these dogs further, both clinically and in the papers, uh, GI disease is a problem. And we, we know already from, from uh, the literature and our own clinical experience that brachycephalics have their own proclivity towards gastrointestinal disease anyway. So is a GI disease a primary condition or is it secondary? We see it in conjunction with brachycephalic airway disease quite commonly. So you can see things like megaesophagus in these dogs. You can see hiatal hernias. They are more predisposed to gastric distension, uh, pyloric stenosis. You know, are these conditions related to the whole genetic aspect to this, or are they all secondary? And uh, we don't we don't know the answer to it. We, we do know that we do see things in tandem. We can also see these things separately from each other. And um, sometimes you treat one, specifically the brachycephalic airway disease, and the, that, the gastrointestinal component to this also becomes alleviated to some degree. But this is still something that is very subjective, case by case basis. Not every brachycephalic has associated gastrointestinal disease, and not every brachycephalic with GI disease has brachycephalic airway syndrome that's so severe that they need surgical correction. So clinical signs, quite common, right? The loud breathing that we see. And for those dogs that maybe have a gastrointestinal component, there's drooling and the occasional vomiting or regurgitation. Doesn't seem to affect their quality of life per se, uh, but you hear all the time with these dogs that, oh yeah, they, he occasionally has a GI issue, stomach sensitivity. And um, you know, is it related or not? But but your classic classic signs. Uh, uh, some of it, of course, external, and a lot of it is, is internal. And requires uh, diagnostics. The only reason why I mentioned radiographs because the majority of, of uh, doctors are going to perform radiographs initially. It's not necessarily to confirm the condition of brachycephalic airway syndrome because a lot of it's soft tissue, and so you need a, an upper airway exam, which we'll go over. But, but radiographs can help to some degree. You know, we can, we can evaluate the, the soft palate on radiographs, and sometimes they have really bad upper airway obstruction. You can see air accumulation in the, in the uh, ventricles of the larynx. So you can, see, you can see these things. Obviously, you'll notice the, you know, the brachycephalic dogs will have a brachycephalic-shaped skull. And then uh, for lower airway, of course, it's huge. You want to rule out other conditions, especially in older dogs. You're looking for metastatic screening with them, any cardiovascular disease, um, lower airway disease, so you know, the, uh, the classic craniovascular distribution that's associated with bronchopneumonia. Uh, you, want to, you want to be able to, to, um, to rule out prior to surgery, um, see, see if they are okay for anesthesia, and if they need further stabilization before that, uh, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. These are other conditions you want to rule out with, with these dogs. And then this is just depicting measurements that are published that look at whether or not you can assess hypoplastic trachea in these dogs more objectively. So in that, in that initial radiograph I showed you with the hypoplastic trachea, a, you know, is that hypoplastic or not? I mean, I, I don't know. You associate it with the other clinical signs with that dog and decide, okay, it's a brachycephalic with all the, all the symptoms of brachycephalic airway disease. That trachea is narrow. It's probably hypoplastic. But it, you, there, are, there are actually objective measurements you can use for these dogs to decide if the trachea truly is narrow or not. We already talked about computer tomography, so CT scans on these dogs to look at the nasopharyngeal region, and you can, uh, you know, you're looking for basically a, a cloudiness to the to the uh, nasopharyngeal area there. Um, not sure what you do about these. There are reports of stenting these dogs, um, uh, balloon dilation, uh, laser ablation. I've never done any of these procedures. It, I typically treat the more classic uh, diseases with this with this condition, but it's something to, to be aware of, of course. And you know, there is just like everything else, a uh, an attempt to make it a more objective scale when you look at CAT scans and how badly affected these dogs are. So laryngoscopy is going to be the big, the big diagnostic tool, right? So you're already going to be suspicious of the disease with the history and the clinical signs and your initial physical exam findings, but evaluating the laryngeal region is, is really what you're what you're looking at to try and diagnose the elongated soft palate, the inverted saccules, and then whether or not you have any level of laryngeal collapse. 
So we do, we do grade or stage the disease process with laryngeal collapse. Um, three stages typically. There, I have found there, there can be overlap with these. Typically we're looking at this being a progression from one to three, but there can be some sort of mix and matching with these as well. Um, probably because every dog is different and, and of course it's subjective whether or not what the severity of these of these uh, uh, stages. So uh, when you have the stage one, the inverted saccules. So here's a, here's a nice picture of the saccules behind the retinoids. They are uh, um, swollen, they're um, protruding into the airway, which they normally should not really be seen. Then stage two, the cuneiform process of the retinoid. So here's a, a, a picture. Here's the cuneiform process here. When you start to see the, uh, the cuneiform process inverted into the airway, into the rima glottis, you're heading towards stage two. Stage three is the most severe where you have stage one and stage two. And then of course the chromitulate process shown here. This starts to obstruct the dorsal portion of the rima glottis. So here's a nice example. You can see how this larynx is just, it's, it's con con uh, contorted and the rima glottis is very narrow. And you can see how, how erythematous these, uh, the retinoids are. And you know, probably due to upper airway resistance and probably actual physical contact during normal breathing. So, laryngeal collapse is a big problem with these dogs, obviously. And, you know, if you have a fairly mild stage, then it may not be that big of a deal. If you have fairly advanced collapse, then it's a major problem. This is out of my wheelhouse, of course. I don't perform scoping, but um, you, if you have the luxury of, of uh, scoping in your facility or internist who can uh, look at the lower airway, they're basically trying to stage whether or not there's further collapse of the lower airway in these dogs as well. So before we go into um, uh, management of these dogs, um, one, of the, one of my goals with this talk is how to address this issue with clients. Are, are, how many folks here are general practitioners? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so the, what 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 I what I've seen that works over time with client communication with these dogs is I tell the, the client these diseases that make up this whole syndrome are divided into two different categories: those we can fix and those that we can't fix. Plain and simple. You can you can you, either you're performing the procedures yourselves as GPs or you're referring them to a surgeon. But regardless, to set the stage for the clients that their expectations are met, there are things we can fix and things we can't. You know, stenotic nares, elongated soft palate, and inverted saccules, the surgeon can fix those. Well, what are you going to do about those nasopharyngeal problems, or hypoplastic trachea, or bronchiolar collapse, or laryngeal collapse with these dogs? These, these as of right now, are irreparable. There are some papers, we'll go over it, but, but I divide them into those two separate categories, and that way clients understand, we're gonna make your dog hopefully better than this. Will your dog be normal? Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on how, how many aspects of the disease your dog is currently afflicted with. So that helps clients, uh, that helps set the stage for clients for their expectations. Um, and I don't, it's, it's not necessarily true either though that the fixable and non-fixable are primary and secondary conditions, right? So if you consider elongated soft palate as a secondary condition, but that's also a fixable problem for these dogs. So it really comes down to what can we fix and what can't we fix? And that 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 will help, and then and then prior, if you're going to refer these cases, then all the staging that you can that you can have done, the laryngeal exam, the thoracic radiographs, and then of course your your minimum database. So medical management, obviously, you're trying to stabilize these dogs. If they, if they uh, present to you in a crisis, they can't present in in shock from severe upper airway obstruction, and because they are brachycephalics that have not just airway disease but also gastrointestinal disease, as well as cardiac disease. Um, you need to rule out all these things when they come to you in a, in a respiratory crisis. You're trying to figure out is it respiratory, is it cardiac, is it GI? So all the various methods of oxygen supplementation are what you're going to be focusing on depending on what your clinic has available to them. Um, not everybody has oxygen cages in their facility and here's some kind of, I don't know, I've never done these before, but I guess these are ways of, of, of supplying oxygen. Um, Nasal cannulas, of course, very popular as well, very common, either unilateral or bilateral. But anyway, these are, these are various ways of supplementing oxygen to these, to these dogs in a crisis. And then, of course, drugs, right? We want to try and stabilize them by treating their shock. So you do want to increase their uh, intravascular space with fluid boluses or whatever you need to do to get their blood pressures up and get their heart rates down, get their temperatures down, and then um, sedating them and not just to control to control their airway, but also allows the opportunity to perform a laryngeal exam. 
if you're if you're going to sedate these dogs anyway, and, and if they're so severe that they need to be sedated and, and then intubated um, until you can figure out what's going on, that's your chance while you're intubating them to have a quick look at the airway and see whether or not any of the, the uh, conditions that we talked about are present. Now, you may see in elongated soft palate, inverted saccules while you're intubating this dog, but if you're dealing with like a geriatric basophallic with an acute onset of respiratory signs, is that really a decompensation of brachial valve airway syndrome? Or is this, or, or, or is the brachial valve airway syndrome, has it always been there? It has, but is that really what's causing the issue now or is it something else? So, so it's, it's great to take, take the opportunity to perform a laryngeal exam if you're trying to sedate these dogs and intubate them. Um, but you also want to keep an open mind that, that other differentials are still possible. <clears throat> So, so a variety of, of uh, drugs, you know, I just, I just threw some up here that are, that are commonly used. So it's, it's you know, injectable steroid uh, sedatives, um, yeah. And then for the, for the um, uh, two, two comments on the, on the gastrointestinal component with these dogs, um, I, and we can talk about uh, uh, pre-op and post-operative care if, if you're interested in this. The, uh, the, you know, the goal of these dogs is to try and minimize complications either in preparation for surgery or for post-operative. So anti-nausea drugs or um, gastrointestinal motility drugs are, are, are very, very useful for these dogs. And then when you talk about antibiotics, um, you know, these procedures that we're performing on these dogs are not considered sterile procedures. They're, they're fairly dirty, right? Um, uh, we glove up and, and guy up anyway, at least, at least when I perform these. But do they need antibiotic coverage? Maybe, I mean, obviously if there's, if there's um, evidence of bronchopneumonia, then of course, um, but if you have a fairly uncomplicated young dog that you're, maybe you're spaying this, uh, this pug and, and you're going to correct the nares at the same time, do you cover with antibiotics? Um, I, I have, at, at least in the uh, intraoperative period. If you're going to send them home with antibiotics, you know, whether or not it's, it's a, appropriate for something like Invenia to give them the injection and they're good to go to not risk upsetting their gastrointestinal tract, especially if they already have a history of GI disease, maybe, maybe it's worth doing that. I have done that in plenty of cases. Um, or if you send them home with something like uh, cephalodoxine, simple ceph, you know, once a day, so at least you're only treating these dogs once a day for antibiotic coverage. Again, this is, this is only for your run-of-the-mill, stable, no other comorbidities with these, with these dogs with surgery. This is not for the dog that's got heart disease and um, uh, pneumonia and you know, all, all the things. So, so this is just a, a point to make uh, in regards to uh, thinking about if you're going to use antibiotics, can we make it so that uh, there's minimal oral uh, administration of them? Um, I'm a huge fan of metoclopramide, so I'll put these dogs on a regular CRI, um, actually even leading up to surgery. So they'll have in their fluids, and of course they'll stay on it uh, during the procedure and then post-operatively as well. I'm trying to minimize uh, the risk of pneumonia and get the test with these, uh, these dogs as much as possible. Yes? So you get a cute dog that comes in, you know, it's really panting. Remember when that sleeps, you get so many things that could be happening. You're so anxious, oh, let's put an IV in there. Okay, just get an uh, x-ray, obviously they're so stressed out. Obviously, oxygen first. If you give them a sedative, or can that really make them too blah and also not make that worse? Any kind of approach that they break the spell. Yeah, you uh, you want your your goal with the dogs that are coming in a crisis is capture the airway. Whatever you can do to capture that airway. So you, you want you're focusing on intubating them, and so so yes, yeah, so, so sedate, sedate them, and then when you have when you've captured that airway, you'll see the pulse ox will go up, the blood pressure will improve. All the cardiovascular parameters were improved without without really any intervention. Once you can capture that airway, you need to open up that glottis. That's the idea. So whatever you can do to that point, by the way, if you if you are going to intubate these dogs, you're going to undersize the the uh, endotracheal tube because if you don't know at that point if they have hypoplastic trachea or not, so you're going to use a smaller ET tube for those dogs um, to start small and you can always go up from there. But you don't want to shove a, a tube that would normally fit that size bulldog. So not in so undersize them. And, um, and again, the whole point here is, is, is just to stabilize them enough so that you can manipulate these dogs, examine them, collect your diagnostics, to tell the owner, hey, this is what we think is going on at this point. That's your, your goal. Now, once you capture that airway, and let's say the cardiovascular parameters are, um, are still out of whack, you still have hypotension, they're, they're, they've got hyperthermia, um, then you can, you can go ahead and stabilize with fluids from, from there. You, know, um, you don't want to stress them out more. So yeah, yeah. Capture the airway. It's not worth struggling with them on the on the radiograph table um, to uh, to collect your diagnostics. Yeah, capture the airway. 
because again, chances are, you put together the history and the clinical signs and what they're presenting to you, you already have a fairly good idea. At least there's some sort of upper airway thing here. Um, but yeah, you know. And, and, and also too, you know, in general, again, there's a lot of vari variation here, but you know, let's say they're coming into you with respiratory crisis, but they've got uh, because of heart failure. You know, I tend to find those dogs are hypotensive and hypothermic, so they're not going to they're not going to show the hyperthermia and the hypertension you may see with these uh, upper airway dogs. Yeah. But there's also variation there, right? Because obviously it depends on what what stage of shock they're in. So if they are in compensatory shock, they've got the hypertension. If they are decompensating, then the blood pressure goes down. So these aren't clear cut parameters, but that's what kind of helps you in a pinch to figure that, that out. And then in really bad cases, let's say uh, the laryngeal collapse is so bad, there's so much edema around that larynx, you, you can't visualize where to put the, where to place the endotracheal tube where you're trying and just, you just can't get through it. You're using a really small tube. Um, and the more severe cases, a, uh, ooh, sorry, a uh, temporary tracheostomy is going to be the, the way to go to bypass the upper airway. Um, I don't know, uh, do folks here, have you guys performed this at all? Yeah, a few, yeah. So a temporary trach uh, to bypass that, that airway and then capture the upper airway and capture, capture the airways is uh, also something you could do for these, for these dogs. Okay, so surgery. Um, so the, the studies have shown that you can correct their nares early on um, what's early, I don't know, uh, three to five months is what, what most people will quote. Um, then you hope that you can prevent the secondary sequela from this disease. And if you are, if you can perform the surgery, the experience, you can make them look really good afterwards. Um, obviously, the cosmetics to us may not be as informed, but to the owner, of course, they pay probably a lot of money to have this fancy breed and they want the dogs to look good. And so you want to open up the, the nose in a cosmetic fashion, but obviously our main priority is functionality. So there's various ways of, of performing the, uh, the wedge resection. Doesn't matter, it's whatever whatever you end up deciding and learning what they're using before and after picture for these dogs. I mean, just that just that level of opening helps them greatly with the, with the pressure that they're dealing with, um, with the synodic or it's used immediately post-op. So open up those airways and uh, you know, whether or not people perform these during the time of spay and neuter or not, I don't know. Obviously as a surgeon, I see them when they're in a crisis and I don't see them when they're, when they're young. And, and they're young. So. Question. Yes. Do you have a favorite procedure you do for this? Yeah, so, so the resection that I'll perform for these dogs um, is uh, this guy right here. So, I'm, I'm, so eventually I'm creating a basically like a, like a, a pizza slice excision there of the nares, obviously bilateral. And then um, once once you close that, so there's a couple of aspects to this. Number one is, you, the picture didn't show it that well, I guess this is actually a good example. You're, you're gonna go fairly ventral and, and deep in this fold. Because what you'll realize is, is you make this too, too of a superficial wedge here, and you don't, you don't, you don't cut um, uh, deep in the fold here. Once you, once you hold this portion up, to open up that airway, you're not, you're still going to get a certain, a certain level of, in, of um, uh, inward rotation of that nares. So there'll be some improvement there, but it won't be as dramatic as you're hoping for. What you have to do with these is you want to make your incision go underneath the, the folds here, that the AR fold, which I just picture showing, and really, really get a nice, nice chunk of there. Now, I tend to um, undercorrect these first, right, and then place a suture or two, see if I'm happy with it, and then if I'm not take out those sutures and then I cut more. Um, I've never had one where I've overcorrected them, and, um, but I'm trying to make sure that I'm, I'm opening the airway enough, obviously, to create a difference. And you're not going to know that until the patient's awake. So the incision should dive underneath the fold here, and then once you, once you pull back with, with sutures, that, that, uh, that medial portion, then hopefully you'll be happy with the airway. Sometimes what'll happen is I'll repair one side, and, and with, with sutures, everything, and then, because these bleed a lot more than, than you think if you haven't done before, so um, while you're trying to play sutures here, you're trying to work by, you know, you're dabbing them, and then quick suture, and dab, 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 quick suture. Or if you have the sterile Q-tips, those will, those will help as well to minimize hemorrhage. Sometimes I'll repair the one side, and then I'll go and repair the, the, the opposite side, and then I realize, boy, this side looks really good, let me redo this side, and so I'll go back in, or re revise the other side right then and there. I want it to look symmetric. 
Yes. Do you ever use like epinephrine just to control the bleeding? I, I've used epinephrine um, in dogs that have really bad nasal epistaxis for other reasons, but not for this. Mm -hmm. Not for this. Yeah, I, I haven't. I usually find that if uh, um, uh, if you're if you're fairly quick with these, then you just, you just go. I'm also fortunate that usually I have an assistant too, mm -hmm. so they have someone there dabbing for me as well. Yes. Do you use a blade, a uh, uh, laser, or electric arm? Blade. I use a blade. You can you can use laser and you can use cautery. Um, but that's what's supposed to be reported. I've only been taught the, the blade technique, usually an 11 size 11 blade, and I, I love it. I think it, it's great. I think it's great. Um, even though the obviously with laser, the benefits would be the hemorrhage portion of it. Yeah. And and I don't know cosmetically what they look like. I'm sure they look great. Um, but I'm, I'm, I use the eleven blade for it. Did I answer your, your question? Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? This is your, your, your pretty standard setup for these dogs. So um, what I'll do is I'll repair the nares first with, with their, with, they're intubated and their mouth is closed. Repair the nares, make sure I'm happy with it, and then I'll open up their mouth and then work on the, on the palate and the sac rules. And so usually you have like two IV poles or something and you just sort of shimmy some, some gauze and you're trying to hold them up that way. And so, um, yeah, and as you can see, of course, it's not a sterile procedure. Um, elongate a soft palate. So there's, there, are, there are a few ways to perform this procedure. A laser is one option for these. You can use cautery as well. The, the, this, the uh, way I was taught, of course, was suture. But boy, I mean, when I found ligature, that changed the game for me for palates resection. I mean, this this thing is amazing. I, I don't know where they're at now in terms of selling these anymore, but it's a small handheld, uh, very powerful cautery device that just you just you can zap right across the uh, the palate. Now, I mean, it, it's a, it's a beautiful, this is a beautiful thing. It makes the surgery so quick and so clean. However, some of these dogs have such thick palates, meaty thick palates. This the, you can't even you can't even grab them with, with this, you know, they'll just, they'll just keep, they'll keep uh, shoving your instrument off of the, the palate. So it has to be the right, the right case for it, but boy, when you can, you can use a, a, um, a ligature device for this, it makes it really smooth, very easy. And then typically, regardless of the procedure I perform, um, after, right after this completed, when, when the dog is still uh, intubated, I'll take a uh, ice cube, wrap it in some gauze, Attach some hemostats to it, and then and then have the my my uh, the monitoring anesthesia the technician um, hold it there on the surgical side to try and decrease inflammation. I did have a problem when I was using ice cube for these dogs uh, post op. I just leave it in there for about ten minutes. Yes. Do you find suturing or not suturing? Suturing versus not suturing. I mean, for me, not suturing is great. Um, the, the the issue that I've always had with these dogs with suturing them is uh, hemorrhage is always a problem. And then um, you're working in a very small airway usually, and so that's that's difficult as well. And then trying to gauge where you're going because you're trying to you're trying to um, suture and cut in a sequential manner. You sometimes you lose track of your of your of your line of where you're going. And now no one can see this post op, right? The owner isn't going to say, "Hey, my dog's palate is crooked," right? <laughs> you know. Um, but it would be a real pain in the butt if you were doing a like a continuous pattern, let's say, and you realize that. This part's great. This part's too long, and I have to you have to undo your entire suture pattern to, to repair it again. That's that it'll now it's gonna, the bleeding will start again. And so um, yeah. So for me, if I can avoid suturing, then then I, then I will. Yeah. That's that's yeah, sorry. Did you say that not suturing was a great idea? Yeah. The question was: Is suturing better versus not suturing? And then. No, 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 you, you still have to seal the edges of the palate. Yeah, so sorry, yeah, so, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So yeah, so, so um, um, if you are using a, a laser or using a, a, a cautery device, then suture, of course, won't be needed. If everything goes well, it should not be needed. But otherwise, if you're not going to use those devices for the procedure, then, then you have to suture them. And you'll notice with the really thick palates too, they've got, we've got two layers to them, and then, and then obviously it's a, you've got to get the closest edges, so. And once once the palate is resected, um, then then you can have a better look at the uh, saccules um, behind the arytenoids there and, and see whether or not they need to be repaired. So that'll be the next slide. One final point to this slide as well. You know how, how much how much of a transection do you do to the, the, the palate? So you know mo most of the, of the time you're trying to have it where 
the, um, the palate ends at the level of the very tip of the epiglottis. Some dogs are, are so bad that you're still going to have somewhat of an elongated palate, but maybe if they can just, just barely touch the tip of the epiglottis, that's fine too, but that's sort of your goal. Keep in mind when you are trying to gauge how much to cut, when you have the dog's mouth pried open with an endotracheal tube in your way, if that's going to alter the anatomy of where that palate sits in relation to that epiglottis. So what I will uh, do is, is I, especially if I'm using ligature, it's really great. I can place ligature across the palate where I plan on cutting and then relax the mouth and then just slow, slowly pry it open to see am I happy with where that palate is sitting now. And then I, I just repeat that process over and over again. Because you'll think it's, it's beautiful and then you, you, you undo the dog setup and you realize, oh boy, I, uh, I overcorrected this. So, so um, uh, keep in mind, it's gonna, your setup is gonna distort the, the anatomy of the, of the larynx as well. Now, with, with, with diverted saccules, um, I've become more conservative with these over time. Sometimes after you correct the nares and you correct the palate, um, this is intra, this is, this is during the procedure, the saccules don't become as evident anymore. Um, so I've, 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 I've been cutting these, these saccules less and less, and then my conversation with the pet owners is maybe I'll cut them, maybe I won't. And may or, maybe that may be a good decision, maybe not. And if it's a problem, then I may have to re redo it, you know, go back in at a later, later point or remove the saccules. So I, I don't know, these, these are clearly, we think, the consensus is your secondary changes. So, so when you're kind of hoping if you repair the nares, repair the palate, and these saccules aren't just bulging into the airway, um, if they're fairly mild, maybe try to leave them. These pictures aren't great, uh, they're, not, they're not very clear here, but um, anyway, here, here's somebody using a ligature really sure device to, to remove the saccules. You can use medicine bombs for these as well. You can use regular cautery. Um, some some uh, techs say just cutting, the, cutting them and leaving them, but I do find that they actually, they actually do bleed, so um, I tend not to just cut them and leave them alone. Uh, I'm using, again, the same, the same ligature device they use for the palate I'm using for the saccules. But um, even saccules, yeah, it's kind of a question mark there, in my opinion, whether or not you have to repair them, but just the whole point of this slide is if you're performing your upper airway exam, at least you know where to look. This slide is more for those um, irreparable conditions. You know, we, we have performed tracheal stents for dogs with hypoplastic trachea. I'd say mixed results there. I don't know if that's, that's gonna be the future of this, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It, it makes sense. It may be that the issue with these dogs um, is that uh, as opposed to, you know, chondromalacia with, with collapsing trachea, where it's a, a weakening or a softening of the cartilage, these dogs have a hardened cartilage. The tracheal rings are hardened. so. I don't know if stenting is the way, but we've, we've tried it in those cases where you, you, you repaired everything that's repairable and they're still, they're still struggling and so this is sort of a salvage attempt with, with them. Um, original lateralization, so the tieback surgery that you normally reserve for laryngeal paralysis, you know, does that help dogs with um, really bad laryngeal collapse? I mean, maybe, theoretically, we've done that as well. Again, these are salvage procedures. These are after you've done the routine repairs ruled out everything else for these dogs preoperatively. You do the routine repair and they're still having issues. Like issues to the point where they can't even leave the hospital because they're still struggling to breathe. And, um, and, and you, you've reevaluated their airway a day or two after surgery, but they still haven't left the hospital yet. Things look good in your repair and you're thinking, okay, well, he still has laryngeal collapse or have a plastic trachea, maybe we should do something about it. So the, so the, the same sort of options for laryngeal paralysis maybe are applicable for these dogs, again, in this severe scenario where you need something to salvage this dog's quality of life, otherwise it's, you know, it, it, there's not much, not much hope there. So, arytenoidectomies um, and tiebacks are options that I've performed for these dogs that are really struggling, and again, mixed results, mixed results with them. I mean, it may just be that, that the whole airway structure at that point is, is so far gone from many, many years of upper airway obstruction that it's just, the repairs just aren't going to hold, but I don't know. It's, it's salvage stuff, you know. Um, here's, a, here's an example. I mean, I mean, laryngeal collapse. I mean, these arytenoids are are overlapping with each other. It's so bad. I mean, there's there's and the, and the whole dorsal portion of the rima glottis, which is which is caudal to these structures, 
you know, they're, they're being covered in the picture, but it just all collapsed. I mean, this is just severe vertigo collapse. And this reminds me about pneumonia again, postoperatively. Um, and then some of these dogs that are having a rough recovery after surgery, and you're, you're trying to uh, um, capture their airway, and they're having issues, or you just you literally can't get them out of, uh, out of a sedated state than a, than a, 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 a temporary trait until their, their perilaryngeal edema has, has improved enough where you can remove the trait, or they're going home with a permanent trait if there's no other options for these dogs. And that's, and that's a whole, it's a whole management on itself, and you have the right owner and the right dog, and, and even that's not always great. But they still have those dogs that are so badly affected still have lower airways that are also badly affected. You know, bronchial or collapsed. Um, so, outcome overall, at least in literature, is, is pretty good. There's fairly low mortality. Um, when you look at the studies, six month post op, uh, based on on clients' perception of how their dog is doing, you know, excellent. 65% good, 25% a year post-op, 50% are considered excellent, 40% moderate, 2% poor. And, and you know, this, this, may, this may be just the result of all the other issues that we kids can't fix with these dogs and that are permanent changes and they, you know, they're not gonna, they may get better but they're not going to resolve and so you have, you have always, all these issues with them, you know. So when you look at the literature, the prognostic factors, early surgery is better, you know? We, we, we want to be a little more proactive with these, with these dogs. And then of course the younger dogs are gonna have less of the secondary changes or at least not as severe as the, as the older dogs. Learn to collapse, major issue for them. It's gonna affect the prognosis for sure. Obviously the more advanced the collapse, the worse the prognosis. Hypoplastic trachea definitely adds to their prognosis as well. And then the associated GI disease, those dogs that do have GI disease, preoperatively tend to have a not as grave of, of an outcome than those uh, without GI disease. It doesn't preclude them from having surgery, of course, because you can still improve the gastrointestinal disease for the repair of these dogs' the upper airway issue, but just it's a, it's a, the point is to have that conversation with the client to say, and your dog has chronic GI issues that I've been seeing you for for years. It may be related to this, it may not be, we don't really know. And it may or may not affect the prognosis after surgery, we don't really know. So. The, the, the key points here um, that I, I, uh, hopefully we, we went over, client communication is key, repairable versus non-repairable issues, how it ties into GI diseases being a problem, keeping in mind uh, yeah, the GI portion of this, and then um, the surgical repairs are going to be tailored to the case. And just like anything else we do, right? There's not a one size fits all for these dogs, but you want to, you want to repair what makes sense for them, repair the, what is repairable, and uh, you know, over time with more and more experience, if you're going to tackle these surgeries yourself, it just takes time and you'll get better and better at them. Um, with the palate, one more thing I want to say, I always refer to you know, undercorrect rather than overcorrect. I'd rather have the client piss off at me that I have to redo the palate and it's still too long than, than it being way too short. You can't fix that problem. And now they have you know, nasal reflux and all of those issues, so I forgot to mention that. Yes? That was my question, some people find to be overcorrected. Yeah, so overcorrection of the palate, typically what you're going to see with them is um, at, when they ingest food, it's gonna go up the nose. And so you're going to see sort of the brown, you know, mucoid, um, purulent material from, their, from the nasal passages. And then of course, they're more likely to have aspiration pneumonia from that as well. They, don't their, they, don't, they can't protect their airway as, as well, so chronic bronchopneumonia is gonna be an issue for them also. But usually what the client's gonna see is that every time they eat, they're, just, they're getting gurgly and, and there's schmutz coming out the nares. Yeah. I thankfully not would haven't had that be an issue yet. Yeah. Because I mean I you know I don't I don't know if anyone here has a, a, a remedy for that, but I don't know how you fix that other than maybe you know trying things like uh, um, elevating their food bowls and trying to find the right texture of food that might work for that dog. Maybe they have to have more of a canned diet or adding water to the kibble. You know, uh, <coughs> getting them upright. Yeah. Treat them like a mega esophagus. I mean, I don't, I don't know how you manage those, those cases. I didn't find anything in the literature for that. So. Yes. I work for the rescue, so a lot of the times the, the bullies that I'm seeing are five, six years old. Is there still a good benefit from doing the barrier surgery at that age, or at that point is it kind of like, well, I've already got such and all these other issues? How much benefit is it from all? So yeah, so the, the question is, if you have if you have a, a middle-aged older dog with a great spallic airway disease, is it still repairing something like the nares? Is that going to really improve all the secondary changes that they likely have accumulated over over those years? Uh, yeah, it, it does improve them, absolutely. Yeah, I, I've repaired um, uh, bulldogs in like the early teens, and uh, 
you know, and you know, I have a conversation with the owner, obviously, we're, we're, we're not going wild, wild west on them, but the uh, owner understands we're going to try and do this. The Nares are, are one of the biggest um, uh, contributors to, contributors to uh, upper airway resistance for these dogs. It's crazy how, how just that what seems like a small opening, you know, contributes a lot to the airway resistance and all the downstream effects to it. So yeah, so st still worth still worth screening them for other condition. Again, if you have the right owner and you know, or you know, or you're looking to, to rescue to um, uh, make this dog adoptable, so it's still worth screening them for all the other conditions, making sure they don't have any lower airway disease, cardiac disease, um, neoplastic disease, and then once you confirm it's all upper airway stuff, yeah, it still helps them. It still helps them. Yes. Yeah, so the question is, do you give steroids to the thickened one? Um, I, they actually, for, for me again, I may be a bit more biased because I see a population of dogs that are really messed up. Uh, they all get steroids for me. Yeah, they typically are going to get um, cytomedrol uh, perioperatively and then post-op sort of as needed depending on how things, are, how things are going. I do find that I use less steroids in these dogs when I started the, the whole ice packing thing. I mean, it helps a lot with, that with the uh, edema from your surgical site as well as the perioral edema. Those dogs have bad laryngeal collapse. But uh, yeah, I, I, I do use steroids with them. Yes? Yeah, so the question is prior to referral, do you want to put them on steroids or not? Um, for, for me, personally, it's whatever you think the dog needs to be stable enough to be, to be sent over. Because let's say, for example, this is the kind of pet owner that really wants to talk to the surgeon and not, not be sent to the ER, let's say at three in the morning, and, and it's a whole thing. Um, then whatever you can do to stabilize them, great, yeah, yeah. I, but I'm also a bit more lenient with this stuff too. I know there are some surgeons that would absolutely cut my throat for saying that. But I, I'm, I'm totally, I'm totally fine with it. You know, I also have a problem with like NSAIDs being used before TPLO. Like I'm fine with it. But a lot of surgeons will say, no, it's gonna cause the bleeding issues, you know? And I don't know if I've noticed the difference myself, but my, my personality is a bit different too. <laughs> but yeah, I'm, I'm fine with whatever it is that you think needs to be done. You know, I had them come over to the hospital with IV poles, intubated, fluids running, and the pet owner brought them that way. Like, it, yeah, so, it, you know, sure, why not? <laughs> yes. I have three questions. Yes. With your dose of polymedrol, do you change their speed eating for post-op and for how long? And are you going to pull the plasma What's the last question? The plasma where you like, cut out the muscles and oh. pull it forward rather than Okay, yeah, so um, so first question is the, the dose of steroids. So um, usually the cyamedrol 10 mix per keg is what I'm going with. Um, uh, yeah, and you know, I, I be, what's that? I'll repeat that once if I have to, that's it. So they're gonna, they're gonna get one dose of like pre-op or perioperatively, just as an expectation for the inflammation that's gonna happen with the manipulation of surgery. And then if they're really struggling post-op, I'll give another, another dose. From there, I'm kind of hoping that I'm done with the steroids. Um, the second question was their dietary modification postoperatively. Absolutely. So just like with laryngeal paralysis dogs, I will have the owner hand feed meatballs to the dogs. We know we know how how Greg spouts like to eat, and um, and so if you can slow down that process, that that it will hopefully help minimize um, uh, pneumonia developing. Also, there are some thoughts, at least with with laryngeal paralysis dogs, that with kibble the the dust as they're chewing, maybe those dust particles settle in the lower airways and increase exposure to pneumonia. So adding water to the food or just feeding them canned food and then elevating the, the food bowls um, as well. But ideally just hand feed them in the, in the you know, post-operative period. Um, that's at least gonna happen from the time of the operation when they're ready to eat to discharge. And then, I mean, I'm a bit more aggressive with post-operative treatment because you're trying to just minimize obviously everything going wrong. So I'll have the clients basically do that regimen for feeding until I send them again for the recheck in, in, in two weeks. And on that point, um, for the recheck for these guys too, the suture I've used for these monocryl, so I don't really plan on remo removing the sutures. I'm just gonna have them fall out whenever. Um, and then of course, there's no real way for me to check the, the, uh, the laryngeal repairs because you have to sedate them for that. And so as long as all clinical, clinical signs are improved, then all I can do with the recheck is check the, uh, the nares and then you know, make sure that there's no evidence of, of underlying pneumonia that's kind of sitting there. And, and then to your third question, uh, no, I've not done the uh, platoplasty for, for these dogs. It's always been the resection of the, of the elongated palate. Was there another hand? Yes.
I'm, I'm on the opposite end of that. Um, yeah, I want them incubated for as long as possible. And I have had those, maybe you've seen videos in the past, I have had those, those dogs that are walking around you know, my hospital with the tube in their mouth, they're breathing great and they're, they're you know, you know, um, they, they, they love their, their open airways. So, and, and the endotracheal tube helps that. So no, I wanna, I wanna keep that tube in as long as possible on, on my end. Um, having said that though, there is something to be said about promoting mobility in these dogs. It's not related necessarily to your question, but um, you, what you don't want to have is a, is a fat, you know, uh, old, lazy, great cephalic just sitting there in a cage post-op. You know, at the hospital, until so discharge, and at home. I want them. I want them to move. I want airway movement. Same thing with laryngeal paralysis dogs. I want airway movement. If they're just sitting there, just a just an old, you know, obese load, just. You know, then they're more prone to having uh, pulmonary thromboembolism as well as bronchial pneumonia. So I want them. I want them moving within reason. If they live in a state that's like really humid or hot, you know, you want to keep those walks in the shade or, or maybe just in, in the house. But I want them up and moving. Um, not hikes. It's not like craziness. Just a you know five ten minute walk, several several hours uh, every few hours in the day to get their airway movement going as well. So. Um, Related to that point, uh, overtly sedating these dogs post-op. So, you know, to me, these dogs uh, post-operatively are they're not painful. I mean, they 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 seem fine. <laughs> they seem the same as they were pre-op in terms of pain status, right? So, um, and and if, especially if they're middle-aged or older, where they're going to be a bit more sensitive to, nar to narcotics. So, I tend to hold back on my opioid uses for these dogs. You know, if I need some sort of analgesics and they're ready, they're ready to handle oral meds, then you know, NSAIDs or something. But th that's you know, you know, or maybe low dose tramadol, low dose gabapentin, low dose stuff. I don't want them gorked in, in a cage or at home just sitting there. Again, uh, predisposing them to uh, to pneumonia. Was another another question? Yes. So, as you show me a clinic that is not a very strong surgical clinic, mm -hmm. I've never felt comfortable giving you the uber attractive and the elongated palate just to look concerned post operatively. Yeah. So the question is, should, should a GP try and tackle these cases um, with operating on them, or just always refer? So the, the this is a, a sort of a, somewhat of a soapbox for me as well in, in terms of you know what what when do you draw the line between what surgeons can you know just take over, right? And when when should a GP's job end? And I'm in favor of two things. Clear client communication, and then your own experience as a, as a GP. Specialists weren't always around, right? So, um, so there was a day where GPs did all this stuff, and it was great. So, um, so it's cl client communication. If you are the kind of pet owner, you know, um, who money is no object, and you want the, you know, the, the top of the top, and I'm confident in my skills as a GP, but you have this this class of doctors that are specialized. Is all they do. Have at it, refer, right? If you're the kind of pet owner that uh, finances are, are rough and you don't really, um, you have the personality type to, to you, you, you trust me, we've been, we've been, um, um, uh, you've been a client of mine for many years, many generations of dogs or whatever, and uh, you want me performing the procedure, understanding that I'm not board certified, but I'm confident that I can do this. And if anything goes wrong, then it's refer and basically somewhat start over, both medically and financially, then I can do the procedure. Something like that. Clear client communications so that they can figure out from their own personality level and their own finances and whatever, what it is they want to do. I'm a huge fan of GPs tackling these types of procedures as long as the, the client communication is clear. You know, you don't want to, you don't want to, you don't want to um, undermine your own expertise. You can, you can do this stuff. There's minimal equipment that's required for these. It's, but there's a learning curve to it. And then the second part of that test client communication is your own experiences. You know, if, if you if you have a doctor in your facility, the GP who's done many of these, and they're happy to show you how to do it, and you have the right client to understand, tackle them, man, go at it, and and and, and do it. Yeah, um, yeah. Obviously, complications are always possible. They're always they're always possible. Things happen uh, despite your best efforts. So just clear client communication with if X, Y, and Z occur in my hands. I may end up sending you to the ER, and they're gonna have to take over from there and, and all that stuff. So. Um, yeah. My only hesitation in general really is how much staging do you do pre-op? Which again, you, obviously you, you do that all the time, obviously. Um, but uh, you know, um, working up a, a one-year-old brachycephalic 
that has some clinical signs of this is different to some degree than working up like a, a 13 year old, uh, you know, Cadillac King Charles that has heart, heart murmurs and what have you. So, um, you know, I, I, I've staged these dogs, I mean, I mean, all the way, you know, to uh, not just throughout the radiograph, but echocardiograms, um, um, lower airway scopes, the gamut before I even cut them. If they have all the problems anyway and the client's willing to, then yeah, I'll work them up like crazy beforehand. And of course, usually I'm spoiled. I've got internists too in the building, so it, you know, mm -hmm. it helps. Or. Any other questions? That's it. Here's my contact information if um, folks want to get a hold of me, and uh, I, I appreciate your time. Thank you.